today is going to be a conversation. Uh, we're not going to run through a number of slides here, um, but we're just going to talk about uh, Nick's experience at Thomas Somerville, and uh, hopefully there's some takeaways for all of you, some learnings that you can bring back into your organization. So formally, I'll kick it off. My name is Judd Marcello, and I'm the CMO of Connexium. And uh, a quick commercial on Connexium. We've been around about 15 years. We're an, we're, uh, we, we are a trade document automation platform. We help automate uh, the most complex and critical uh, business documents um, that are used in exchange between buyers and sellers. Um, and we work within the order to cash and procure to, procure, excuse me, procure to pay process. And we deal with like use cases such as sales orders, supply chain, and accounts payable invoices. Okay. And uh, we do good work with Nick and Thomas, uh, Thomas Somerville. Yep. Nick is here today. He's director of e-commerce uh, and he has been kind enough to uh, give us some of his time to talk about what's happening at Thomas Somerville and uh, what he's doing there. So Nick, I'll uh, pass it off to you if you want to give an introduction to yourself, talk about your company. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Judd. And thanks for everybody for, uh, for uh, being a part of this. Like, like Judd said, this is going to be pretty informal, you know, just a casual conversation about it. So a little bit about the Thomas Somerville company. We um, <clears throat> were 80 members and we started in 1861, uh, originally as a brass foundry, um, family owned. Um, and from 1861 to now, we've evolved to a plumbing and HVAC distributor with 20 locations in five states in DC with nine retail showrooms. Um, and we are still, we are still family owned. Um, and, you know, kind of a little bit about me, I guess. I, uh, I've been with Thomas Somerville for, for a little over four years now. And up until recently, until I took this e-commerce position, I was running a branch for him kind of until we realized that there was a need to really put a huge focus on e-commerce. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, that's kind of what I do now. Um, and that's kind of focusing on e-commerce for us has been a very, very important thing because we are not the biggest guy in our market, like some of you guys are, I'm sure. Um, so we, in order for us to kind of provide the highest quality plumbing and HVAC products and, you know, the industry's best customer service to be our, our customer's distributor of choice, we knew we had to evolve and really get engaged in all things e-commerce. And that's where Connexium kind of fit in for us. So that's kind of my short, you know, 90 second or two, you know, two minute elevator speech about Thomas Somerville and what we have going on. Cool. Th thanks. Thanks for that, Nick. I, I, um, I have a question for you in regards to the e-commerce play. So you said you've been there for a while, about four years, and you moved into e-commerce a couple years ago, maybe? Yep. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. Okay. You know, and you, you called out the fact like e-commerce is important because, um, you know, you have to meet the needs of your customers, better serve them, et cetera. Like what happened in the business, you know, almost a couple of years ago when you said, we, we need to invest in e-commerce. Like what was happening in the market? What, what um, trends did you start to see from customers, behavior changes? What preempted that? Well, so, you know, one of the things that, that I think we noticed that we really started to pay more attention to was the, the need for kind of immediate feedback. So what our customers wanted was immediate feedback. Um, and, you know, even, even before like COVID happened, we, um, we were maybe lean in some places, you know, kind of at the sales, the sales side of things. And we, we knew that um, we needed to try to supplement that with kind of an online platform and sales automation. And that's, that's kind of where, that's kind of where it started was we just, we recognized a need and we just didn't have a guy to kind of take it and run with it. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we started with it and why we started with it. Yeah. Did you, did you see, um, usually these needs, they're, they're, they're driven by changes in the marketplace, but most often they're driven by changes in customer behavior. Were there, was there anything happening within your customer base that said, Hey, they're starting to look at the way they order products or engage with us or operate in the market differently that, that you said, we, we need to get out in front of this. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it happened for us a little bit differently. So, you know, like I mentioned, we're not the biggest guy in the area. Um, so for us, for us, what we kind of tried to do was follow the biggest guy's bow wave and maybe just kind of get right in behind them, you know, not necessarily trying to reinvent the wheel, 
Um, but we just, we realized that um, there's, there's been a shift in our customers' behaviors, right? When I first started in the industry 15 years ago, um, and I imagine way before then, the, one of the most important things about um, kind of customer service and selling to these guys, it was, it was knowledge. You know, I needed to, you know, customer needed to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, what, I have this many BTUs on my boiler. It's going in, it's going here, it's venting this way. What should I get them? And it's shifted now from knowledge to accessibility and kind of those, those things about customer service that transcend every industry, not, not wholesale, you know, not, not any other industry. Um, so where before it was very much, these people have to know everything. You know, our teams have to know everything. All that information is available now online. It's all available places. Um, and, you know, one of the other things that we noticed was our, our industry is starting to get a little bit younger. So you have, you have, like, I'm 36. You have a lot of younger folks now kind of in decision-making positions at these companies. So the trend is going much younger and way more digital. Got it. Okay, I, that's that's an interesting topic. I, I want to come back to that one in a second. The idea of younger decision making and a different approach, uh, you know, to to managing the business or, or evolution of business. We'll come back to in a second. I want to stick with the the customer side of things. You mentioned, you know, customer behavior change, um, accessibility of information, needing to be uh, needing to have speed and in, in, in terms of responding to them. Tell me a little bit about your customer service organization. Um, what does it look like? The size of it? What that interaction looks like? What, and what are their responsibilities? Yeah, so we are, you know, we're set up, I would say that we're set up like a pretty traditional wholesaler. You know, we have outside salespeople out on the road, and then we have a team of inside salespeople who support. Um, and, you know, for those of us in the industry, we know that kind of the traditional outside sales role, it's, it's not necessarily a walking around, shaking hands and kissing babies kind of role anymore. It's, it's a, there's, there are lots of hats that get worn by those people, but in general, you know, kind of the, the, the way that it works for us is outside sales team goes and drums up the business and then says, call my inside sales team, right? And then the inside sales team, they're the ones who are sitting in the office, hammering out the orders, fielding the phone calls, checking price and availability for customers that, that kind of thing, not not too dissimilar than what than what any you know than what I imagine folks on this call do. And do you um, what? There's also a lot of discussion, I think, in the industry about talent and being able uh, uh, huh. yeah. you know, <laughs> lack, lack, lack of lack of available talent to bring into an organization, right? Certain skill sets are just to yep. fill roles, like that's unless big, you're going to home grow it, right? Yeah. Unless you're going to unless you're going to develop it yourself. We, well, I mean. Sorry, go ahead, John. Well, that, that was going to be akin to my question here is like, do you, do you, what is the, is there a changing nature of the inside sales role and the, and the outside sales role and, and what the expectations are of them going forward? And, and maybe more specifically, let's talk about inside sales. You talked about they're inside hammering out order, excuse me, they're, they're in the office hammering out orders and there's, there's other tasks that they're responsible for. Is, is that, um, is that the productivity that, that you're expecting out of that group now, or is things changed? Is their role changed because the customer behavior changed? So sort of, well, so let me, let me kind of answer kind of the first part of your question about the talent. Um, you know, I think that the, I've, I've always kind of said that the most difficult person to hire is an inside sales team is a, is a member of an inside sales team because it's not like that person, it's not like there's a giant bench of people kind of waiting to get hired either right out of high school or college or out of a trade school or something like that, who's got kind of the industry knowledge already. So um, what, what ends up happening, at least for us, is we end up taking that person and very quickly throwing them into kind of an inside sales seat and saying, okay, figure it out, right? There's, especially for some smaller companies, there isn't there may not be a great training piece of it, um, but but I think looking I think looking ahead, Judd, um, kind of somebody sitting in sitting in the office typing away at their keys and entering orders and writing a billion orders a month and a billion dollars in sales every month, like the, the actual writing of that stuff, that's 
that's not really what we need them for now. Like that's just not, that's not where, that's not where we're really seeing the value, I guess is what I'm saying. Got it. So, okay. That, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. Cause I think that, you know, and a lot of the people that we talk to, a lot of the businesses that we talk to, it's, it's productivity is a big topic of conversation. Like how to get not only your CSR team more productive, but more productive on the right things, like better serving your customer. Like that, that is a topic of conversation. I think that we deal with, you know, on a daily basis. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we kind of, well, look, one of the reasons why we brought on Connexium is we wanted to, um, without getting too far ahead here, but we wanted to make sure that our sales teams were focusing on big brain activities and not necessarily the, um, you know, just typing on the keys. Um, and we, we realized like Thomas Somerville is very spoiled. We have some, we have some great tenure with our inside sales team and our outside sales team. You know, people have been with us for a while, which is awesome. Um, and we want to make sure that those folks are using that knowledge the right way and that it's not getting wasted by entering in orders, for example. We want to keep those people on the phone with customers or negotiating deals with vendors or something, right? Something, something other than that. Sure. And I think that, I think that, you know, 2020 taught us a lot of things, uh, you know, as human beings, but, <laughs> but for this context, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, we learned quite a bit. And I think that, um, you know, the, one of the things that really impacted everyone in some way, shape or form is this idea that your business needs to be prepared for massive disruption, <laughs> right? Of any, of <laughs> any type, <laughs> right? And, and, and of the worst kind, the kind where the entire country shuts down, right? <laughs> that is, yeah. that, that's significant. And, you know, a lot of companies really weren't necessarily prepared for that, right? And while it's, uh, while it's the buzzword of all buzzwords, digital transformation, uh, you know, is a serious thing when it comes to evolving your business, making your business future ready to survive any kind of like massive um, disruption that happens in the future. Uh, tell me a little bit about how Thomas Somerville, what you learned from 2020 and how that's changed your thinking about um, the role of technology in your business and uh, the role of serving customers in your business. Sure. So, you know, we, we realized that, I mean, look, we're, what we're talking, what we're talking about is COVID, right? Like yeah, that's, sure. that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. And we, we were not immune to, to any of the struggles with it. Um, but, you know, for, for all the bad that COVID did, um, it also did some great things too. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of shifting the focus and, you know, what it, what it did for, I think what it's doing for the industry and depending on what you're looking at, it'll give you a different number, but it's, you know, Hey, it's, it's shifting the narrative ahead with adoption of technology, three, five, 10, 20 years or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, and, and we, we realize that we have, you know, especially with somebody like Connexium, we have technology available to soften the blow. If we may be, you know, if we lose an associate for whatever reason, you have to lay somebody off or, you know, somebody leaves and goes and works somewhere else by, by adopting technology. Um, it, it makes it, it takes some of that burden away. And that's, and that's really what we, that's really what we found when it comes to um, kind of the technology piece for, for Thomas Somerville. And, really just because it put everything underneath a magnifying glass for us and really kind of, you know, made us examine kind of where we can, where we can do better and what we can do differently. And adopting the technology was, I mean, it was just, it was a part of it. We had to do it. We, we had to, we had to evolve. We had to do something different. Because like I said earlier, we're not the biggest guy in the area. You know, we had to, we had to, we have to adopt technologies that other guys aren't in order to provide that level of customer service that our customers expect because regardless of um regardless of whatever's happening the customer still expects you to take care of them right they, they still expect you to be there for them and leveraging technology is something that helped us do that you know it's um it's really interesting. You keep kind of hitting on that point around, you know, customer customer service and customer expectations. And I think 
you know, ultimately, you know, maybe I'm a bit biased in a sense, but I think that is the role of, of technology is like, how do you incorporate new methods, new means inside your organization to deliver that better customer experience? And, um, you know, and, and you really need to do it without forcing any change on your customers themselves. Like it has to be completely yeah. transparent to the customers, right? It's not gonna matter to them if you force them to change their habits and behaviors in order to accommodate you. That's not the name of the game. When, you, um, when you're looking internally, when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about buying technology, when you're bringing about a new solution, how do you keep the customer experience um, center in all of that? Like, how do you make sure that you're accommodating that and making sure that you're not forcing them to change? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we realize that people are creatures of habit and we run up against it sometimes with even using, using Connexium now, we've, we found that really the most difficult bit has been behavior change, not, not of our customers, but, but, of our, but of our associates, because you're taking a guy who's been entering orders for 10 years and saying, hey, I, I need you to not enter the orders and start using this piece of technology. Um, so we, we tried to look for things that weren't going to require the customer to make any changes. Um, because then the only upside, or there's only upside. If, if the customer doesn't have to make a change and I can say to him, because I'm using Connexium, for example, whenever you ask me for a hundred of something, it's going to pull it off that document as 100, 100% of the time, or um, you know, it's going to get delivered to the correct address 100% of the time. That's what we wanted to do. And I, I kind of use the example kind of maybe two or three years when I, after I got into the industry, um, I sent a truckload of steel pipe 42 foot double random steel pipe downtown to a job site in dc and the steam fitter on the job called me and i kid you not i thought he was going to kill me because it was supposed to go to the fab shop not to the job site so i had a tractor trailer blocking connecticut avenue right in the middle of downtown dc for an hour while we tried to sort it all out and you know, so we, you know, we, we're, when we looked at Connexium specifically and, and other technology vendors, we think about, okay, what are we going to do? What can we do that's going to make it seamless for our customers and limit the mistakes? Not that people are prone to making mistakes, but, you know, people are prone to making mistakes. Sure. It happens. You yeah. Know, we're humans, right? Technology is mm -hmm. not, right? So we expect more out of technology in a way, right? Um, so we can expect more out of ourselves. Yeah. You called out one other thing there. You just mentioned change internally. You know, somebody who has been an inside sales rep, um, you know, hammering away on invoices for years, working with the company. Now they have to change. You know, one of the other topics of conversation we always run into is this idea of um, change management inside an organization when, when geared around a, uh, an automation strategy, like an enterprise-wide or a company-wide automation strategy, right? Because usually it's not just replacing one process with a piece of technology. It, there, there's a, a horizontal impact across the organization that says, hey, when we put this in place, there's upstream and downstream impact. What has been your company's approach to change management internally? Maybe even more so, has it been um, mandated top down? You know, when, when you're into um, uh, uh, implementing technologies or technology strategies, is it, is it a top down mandate? Yeah, it, it has to be. The, the only way, you know, the only way that it works is if it comes from the top down. If you have, you know, our, our e-commerce team is very small. It's, it's just a few of us. And so I can be the internet guy and the e-commerce guy standing in front of a branch talking about, here's why you need to do something. And that's only going to resonate so much because people are then just going to revert to type. They're just going to do what they've been doing. Um, so it's, it's got to come down from the top. Um, and if it's, if it doesn't, then then you're going to lose. Then you're really just going to lose the benefit. So what we've so what we've done is we've you know we are making without getting super specific, but we are um, basically making it mandatory that if you have a customer that uses a um, a structured document, something that that Connexium can process, you just kind of don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. It's going to get processed by the sales automation tool and. 
you know, people kind of buck at it a little bit, but I think, you know, we have, um, we have a couple of huge customers that are using the sales automation, you know, Connexium right now. And if you ask a member of the inside sales team who used to do it, um, cause they, they wouldn't want to work for us without Connexium, yeah. right. Without, without the, this piece of technology, because they don't want to have to start entering all of these orders again. It sounds miserable. Yeah. And it's, it's given them so much time back, but it really only works and it has really only worked for us because we've hammered it at sales meetings. We've driven it from the top down like a hammer and a nail. And um, it's been, it's been a challenge for sure, but um, it's, it's, it's really starting like our return on investment is, is amazing with it. Yeah, cool. Look, okay. That that's, that's really helpful. I want to get to some of that other stuff around ROI. You know, it's really important, but, I want to use what you just said and go back to a point you made earlier about a, um, a, a, the next generation, a younger generation um, inside a lot of companies like yours, yours uh, originating back in what, 1860, 1861, 1861, right? You're an old company, right? Evolving over the decades. And, but you yeah. constantly have to evolve, especially as being, you know, like you say, you know, not the biggest player in the market. You know, for someone, and I think this is a big topic actually throughout the industry. Um, and uh, I'm sure maybe for some people on the call too, if you have an opinion on this, would love to hear it. Like you being someone who is quote unquote of that next generation in driving a digital agenda in the organization um, and, and saying, hey, look, there are, there are different me methods and ways that we can bring in here. They might be a little disruptive up front, but the long-term value is huge. Did you have a challenge selling that in internally? Like what, what steps did you have to go through to say, hey, I want to make a business case for making an investment here because I think it'll make us better. You know, I guess we're a little bit of a different animal um, in, in that, you know, our executive team is pretty, is pretty kind of forward thinking when it comes to some of this stuff. And um, if we, if we can make a decent use case for say, bringing in a new technology vendor, we're, we're typically, you know, we're pretty easy to, give it a shot. Um, but, you know, we definitely, um, it's, I think, you know, Judd, I really, like, I just, I really think it goes back to people are super resistant to change and you just have to be able to show it to them and say, look, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to do a thing, something like this, right. Where we have 10 or 15 or 20 people, you know, sitting in a call and talking about the things it can do. It's another thing to you know, it's, an, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to kind of be about it. And, um, you know, we, we noticed that when we started to get more people to adopt some of these technology things and we could actually show some of the benefits, it, whatever doubt people had, just kind of completely washed away. Got it. Okay, cool. Let, let's do this then. Let's do this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, let's get a little more tangible here about the relationship that we have together. Um, yeah. because I, think, I think this is a good entry point to that because I think there the people on the call here, uh, you know, in, in some way, shape or form, you're either all, you all have an automation agenda that you're pushing inside your organizations, or maybe you're thinking about doing that. And what I, what I, what I want you to leave with today is, you know, some learnings on uh, what Nick had to go through to, you know, raise his hand and say, hey, I think I found a solution here and how it's going to drive our business forward um, and how that may help all of you. So Nick, how about a little bit of background on, you know, when you moved into e-commerce, you saw a need for the role of automation and, you know, how you went down the path of looking for a vendor and, and ultimately, you know, working with us and, and, and thinking about how you create that change internally. Yeah. So, um, you know, like, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, about a year and a half ago is when, is when we maybe, maybe getting on two years now, um, this is when we really decided to put a focus on, things, e-commerce, and, and not just sales automation. Like we redid our website, tfconline.com, plug for Tommy Somerville. Um, you know, and we, um, and we realized that, that we just, we needed to make this change. So kind of one of the things we looked for, you know, and again, talking about our relationship with Connexium is um, we actually ran into the guys at Connexium at an AD e-commerce summit back in Miami. Um, and, you know, kind of, talked to him a little bit and said, wow, this is cool. I haven't really seen or heard anything like this before. 
Um, and then from there, it was really, we were really kind of off to the races. You know, one of the things that I think a lot of folks can relate to on this call is um, kind of how much of a struggle working with a technology vendor can be. So for, for me and kind of our executives, one of the things that we were really looking at was who's, you know, customer service, just like customer service for our customers is paramount. It was paramount that we have somebody who's easy to do business with. And um, I, have, I have said this about kind of the Connexium team to anybody who will listen that um, they, it, they've made it really easy to kind of do business with them because um, it, when you're talking about changing the narrative and changing how you're doing business, you really needed we really needed somebody who was going to hold our hand and help us get through it. And it, it took us a while to really get up and running with it. And that's, that's really just because a lot of um, kind of the specifics of connecting, some of it was, was difficult to, it was just very different than the way we've been doing business. So we, we just, we needed, we needed that connection support team to help us kind of get through it. Um, yeah. So that's, that, that's kind of that's kind of how we selected Connexium. Um, you know, and there we're, we're doing some we're doing some great things with with them now where you know we're identifying a giant batch of customers, um, you know, like a hundred to two hundred customers. And then over the next three to six months, we're gonna work with them to get all of those customers using the Connexium sales automation tool and um, you know, Judd, I can I can dive into some of like our numbers that I think may be beneficial for for the folks on for the folks on the call. Or we can do that in a few. We can do it another yeah. you know a little bit later, whatever. I'd love to do that. I just want to call out one thing that you said there that I think is really important. And 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 I'll say this, you know, just from a Connexium point of view, you know, part of our philosophy, you know, in in um, not just in in the in how we build technology, but how we service customers, and it's always been this way, is that. Um, you know, we, we, our technology, our offering, our service, it's, it really caters to each and every individual customer. So you talked about the way that you do business. Now, certainly when you're implementing Connexium or any piece of technology, it's going to change the way you do business. That's the goal, right? That's the objective. But um, we want to make sure that, you know, our technology is flexible enough to adhere to what your business rules are, right? The logic in your business that, that keeps documents flowing between you and your customers or that makes your people efficient like there are certain particulars about each and every one of well your business nick and everybody on the call that um you know you, you can't just override that completely you can't throw everything out the window and drop a new piece of technology and you know there there are certain um there are certain like subjective business rules that need to be that need to be accommodated so i think that's that's one of the things that we really strive to do uh, technology service wise. And you called it out is to make sure that, you know, we're helping your business run appropriately. And that means, you know, our technology has to be flexible enough to learn your business. And then over time through machine learning and, and what have you, you know, it continues to learn and learn and become more and more efficient over time. So you know, I appreciate you calling that out because it's uh, it's a big part of us helping mitigate that, that big, that big change lift that you, that you discussed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so look, I, I want to hear a little bit about, um, like you said, some, some, you know, just really around, you know, hard ROI about using the product, but I, I, I want to slow it down just for a minute. Talk a little bit about what was the problem that you had that forced you to go search for a technology solution yep. and and, and how has now since implementing that changed the way your inside sales reps just operate in a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. So I have a, I have a pretty specific example. Um, we had, we have one customer who, man, they, they, they do, you know, we're a $220 million company, $200 million company. This one customer probably does 15 million of it, um, maybe 10. Um, and one dude was handling that entire account, just one guy. And then what happened, he left. And so we, we were left holding the bag on thousands of orders that needed to get written. And so, so we said, we got to do something, right? We, we got to do something. So enter, enter Connexium and long story short, we 
haven't replaced that person. And, you know, we, we kind of don't, we kind of don't need to. Um, and I, I think it, this kind of, you know, this kind of segues into a little bit about like, you know, the, the technology isn't here to necessarily replace people, but it's helpful when they, you know, the technology is helpful when they do leave. Um, and we, we just, we wouldn't have been able to stay afloat with this one customer were it not, were it not for the technology. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because, you know, there's a couple of things that ring true for me there. One is, you know, another topic, again, that we, 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 that comes up a lot when we talk with, with our customers is, you know, we're not, techno this technology that we offer isn't necessarily, um, the, the intent isn't to replace people. It's to allow people to focus on more value add tasks, like you talked about, more- To big, magnify their big, big brain activities. Where that, they're good. That's right. That's right. But like, I think that, you know, it is so true in, in your company and in almost any company, when somebody has a lot of like internal tribal knowledge and that one person is, you know, a linchpin, and then they leave the company for whatever reason, or something like COVID just forced somebody to stay at home and maybe they can't get in and maybe it's not easy for them to work. Boy, they, 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 they're carrying revenue out the door with them. And yeah. uh, you need to protect that in a way. And I think that that's what I was referring to in terms of business logic and rules that are inherent in your business. You know, If you take them out of the brains and put them into the technology, then you safeguard yourself for when you have you know, some of those challenges, like somebody leaving the company. I think that's, that's really significant. Well, I think, you know, we have, I, I think, I think what it does is it removes kind of, um, kind of the, I guess I kind of have to be careful how I say it, but kind of the reliance on the person, right? If, if, like you said, one person has all the knowledge and then they get hit by a bread truck tomorrow, what do you do? Yeah. And, and that's what, um, you know, that's, that's where the technology, that's where it's helped. That's where it's helped us. It's, it's allowed it's allowed us to say, okay, if this salesperson is going to the bathroom, if they're at a doctor's appointment, if they're off for whatever reason, we have the technology built out now to take care of that customer without that person having to be there all the time. Yeah. You know, it, it, this reminds me, you and I were talking ahead of time, you know, one of our previous conversations, and you were talking about a specific disruption you had in your business around your ERP and that shutting down. Can, can you uh, can you share that story with people and talk about like exactly I can what? I can share as much as I can share yeah, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but what I'll uh, what I'll say you know Connexium has the potential to help you when your ER if and when your ERP goes down um, you know the way because the two systems operate outside of one another um, you can send in an order to be processed through Connexium while your ERP is down. And then when you're in Connexium, will sprinkle a little Connexium magic on it and, and make it good for the ERP. And then when your ERP comes back up, it pulls it from Connexium and dumps it into your system without somebody having to manually enter the order. And that was something that we didn't, that we hadn't considered when we looked at, when we looked at sales automation, we just kind of said, oh man, it's going to make it so much easier to process orders when this guy sends me 50 a day or a hundred a day or whatever it is. We didn't realize that oh man, if the power goes out of or if you know, the internet goes down somewhere or the ERP goes down, that we can build out a universal structured document for an inside salesperson or a counterperson to use it with that customer standing right in front of them. And then when that customer leaves, we just email it in and then it gets taken care of. And then at the end of the day, you're not sitting there taking a handwritten ticket, trying to read somebody's chicken scratch and type it into your ERP. Um, so that was a, we didn't realize that until kind of it happened and we needed it. Yeah. So it kind of helps you hedge a little bit. Yeah, business never sleeps, right? Especially through disruptions and, and, and what have no you. Way. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, we, we try to make it easy on people because, you know, our technology basically works in the background. You know, you may not see it every day. You may not interact with it every day, but it's doing the job, right? And I think that's all about trust and confidence in, in, um, in the technology and the vendor that you choose, you know, just really important when making decisions. Um, hey, look, I want, to, um, I want to go into, I have a couple other questions for you. Before we do, I just want to take pause. We had one question that was posed, and, uh, but Nick, there's, a, there's one question here. Um, it's, do you see a move towards augmented reality for connecting contractor in the field and inside solution 
or sales rep? So I, um, I kind of I wish I could speak more intelligently about that. I've not really, I've not really seen or experienced that too much. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to kind of get talking and get myself down a rabbit hole and then, you know, kinda, I kind of want to stay in my lane. Um, sure. So I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of experience with that. I'd love to be able to talk about it more, but um, yeah. I haven't really seen it. Okay, cool. And Joe, you know, if you have any, if that's a topic you want to address to the group, uh, by all means, if you yeah. want to talk a little bit more about that, dive in. Yes, yeah. um, the uh, we're very much like um, Thomas Somerville. We're we're a hundred twenty year old company. We we uh, service industrial uh, uh, institutions uh, in almost the same space: heating, uh, humidification, hot hot water. We're from a manufacturer, we're an actual manufacturer, and uh, what we've seen is. You know the expense and COVID of not allowing is to send an expert to a factory and review the issue with our product mm -hmm. in the field, and using um, you know Wi-Fi or if you can get on there, guest Wi-Fi, uh, tablet, aiming it at our product, and then and then we have like looked at uh, two different companies that are doing this, and actually uh, take a picture and then you could snap it. And then you could tell the field person, the inside person, could tell the field person uh, they can annotate a snapshot and say, "No, you got your wires wrong," and or can you look at the other side uh, of our product? And right there, uh, you save the, the headache of sending someone out and the delays and get an order. You know, if something's broken. Well, you know, Joe, I, I think that certainly what we've seen is that. Um, like driving around the Capitol Beltway here in DC, Maryland, and Virginia is like the least efficient time that you can, the least efficient thing you can do. So, you know, driving somebody out to a job site to go take a look at something and then driving back to figure it out. I mean, that's why, that's why for this, I didn't drive into my office at headquarters because it's an hour away from my house. And, um, you know, so I think that um, kind of to, to that point, I think that we're absolutely seeing a shift in kind of how much people actually want to see you versus just needing to talk to you, maybe on the phone. Um, and not to say that being in person with somebody isn't adding value, but, you know, we're talking about efficiency, we're talking streamlining this and that. And um, that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing to, to, to hear. It's a very interesting point you bring up. You know, Joe, I, I, we don't have much, I, I certainly don't have a, a lot of experience in augmented reality in, in this context, um, but you know what's interesting here is you do see a lot of augmented reality being introduced into B2C buying relationships. Yep. You know, more people that have the ability to see what their Mac will look like on their desk at home. Yep. View the couch right. in your room, right? Right, right, right. You know, a lot of, uh, you're seeing a massive move to that. And that is, I think that's completely indicative of the path that B2B is going down because some people may not want to go to the showroom to look at that couch or to go and try to visualize it, what it looks like in their living room. And I think in the, in, in because of all the inherent factors that come with like having to travel there, you don't have time to do it. I think that is absolutely playing out in B2B. And, and I'd be interested down the line to find out, you know, what, what more you do with that um, as an example for, uh, for the rest of the industry. That, that's, I think it's a really compelling topic. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. Listen, Nick, look, back to you. We've got a few minutes left here. And, and I think what's most important here, um, at least when it, from our perspective uh, in, in dealing with our customers is, is um, return on investment, right? And uh, that's what we're all here for. We try to here to make you better, uh, try to make you more efficient on the bottom line, help you drive top line growth. ROI comes in many forms. Um, tell me a little bit, tell the group a little bit about you know, the return that you're seeing from using Connexium, how that's impacting your business. Yeah, so I think it's, I think it's probably easiest if I, if I kind of lay it out in terms of like hours saved. Um, so, you know, it's like, so I'll go hours, orders, li and lines entered. Let's, let's, let's do it that way. So from the beginning of this year, um, Connexium has processed 12,000 orders for us. 
which equates to about 150,000 lines. You know, and those numbers, they're just like big numbers. They don't really mean much. So when we, so let's, let's talk about how many hours that's actually saved. That's saved about, you know, 1,300 to 1,400 hours of order entry in six months. So, okay, 1,300 hours, what does that actually mean? Um, that equates to about six months of somebody writing orders, eight hours a day, seven days a week, without taking a break. So that's, we've, we've saved six months of somebody having to do that. And you know, so as I kind of present this stuff to like our executive team and our board of directors and you know, folks like you, um, that for us, that, that equates to about the time equivalent of making about 40,000 phone calls of just like, of maybe like following up on a quote or, um, you know, checking up on a delivery or calling a vendor or something like that. It's given us back 40,000 phone calls wow. across our entire sales team. And that, that I think is when you think it, when you break it down in terms of the hours saved, um, that's, that's really where I think it drives the point home. You know, and I'm not even talking about how like our e-commerce business is up um, you know, sales are up 40%, not, not talking about the connecting piece of it, but just organic stuff through our websites up 40% orders entered up 65% lines entered are up 78, 79%, um, in the, in this six months versus last year, same time last year. Um, the, the time that time saving is impossible to ignore. Yeah. It's impossible to ignore. And then it's given us the opportunity to um, shift what our teams do so that they're being more productive. Because um, kind of the way that we framed it is like, look, we're just trying to give you back time in your day, right? We're, and, and I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the one customer that represents a significant portion of our business um, we are so glad that we don't have to have one guy sitting in there typing out orders for this customer. Like it's, it's just could not be happier. I mean, connection pays for itself just off of that. <laughs> um, but that time savings is huge. Yeah. I, I appreciate you saying those things. I, I think, I think that those, those specific quantifiable ROI points, you know, that that's the objective for most everybody that we speak with. And I think, I think one of the, one of the underlying values of that, like you called out some pretty significant stats and how your e-commerce business is growing. Your digital business sounds like it's really a growth business for you, right? I mean, yep. that's a growth channel. You're going to continue to invest in that. You know, your role is going to get bigger. You're going to get more people. You're going to see more orders coming in. And I think it's really important that when you look at a solution to implement, an automation solution, specifically sales orders, that the solution can scale with your growth as well right? Because yep. it isn't about solving a problem today. It's about accommodating future opportunities, you know? So, and, and, and I know that's, you know, that's part of the conversation we've been having um, is about, you know, supporting you as you drive growth in your business, right? And so, um, you know, sometimes that ROI is immediate uh, and, some, and, and, and sometimes it's also, uh, you know, long-term benefit. Yeah. And, and look, the, um, you know, the, the, the team, not everybody's, again, for us, right? Not every customer's document is written the same way, looks the same way. So we're, we're talking about, we have one piece of software, we need it to be able to kind of evolve with new customers as we bring them on, old customers that we convert maybe to a document that would work to be processed through Connexium. You know, and we've, um, the, the Connexium team has kind of never really said no when we ask if something can be, if a document can be processed through the, the sales automation engine, um, kind of, and uh, kind of one of the things I say to my team is that there are almost, there are almost too many options sometimes. Like sometimes I love for connecting to just say, no, man, I can't do it. Just, I can't do it. Um, but that's, that's, that's not the case. This thing, I mean, it, it does, it scales, it, it's, it's gonna scale with us. And um, we're, we're at the point now where, you know, we're, we're probably, I mean, we're probably never not going to have Connexium now um, because we've, we've seen the benefits. It's been that beneficial. 
Got it. All right. So not to sound too much like a commercial for you, Judd, but yeah, I'm just trying to be honest. Well, well, listen, you, 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 it sounds like we have work to do. Use the word probably. Uh, that's an issue. Okay. We're going to get the team on that right away. Um, no, kidding aside, look, I think that's really important. You know, your business is not like any of the others that we deal with in that, you know, the, the, the documents that your customers use, um, none, no two documents are created alike. You know, they're highly complex. There's high degrees of variability. And you need um, the uh, processing of those documents to be 100% accurate every time. You know, and that's something that we recognize and we take pride in delivering on. All right. So look, a couple minutes left. Last question for you. You've gone down the path. You've championed the change. You've championed the, the business case for the, for the uh, implementation. For the people on the call that are either working on that right now or about to start their own process for you know, just changing the way they do business with technology, can you give, you know, what are your top five tips or so uh, on um, how you start your search and how you think about um, implementation and then utility ongoing? Yeah, so I think the, the, the best way to kind of approach this stuff with technology is to, I mean, it's, it's to really kind of, I, th I think the thing that's been most beneficial for us is kind of really properly vetting it out. Um, you know, Judd, I love you guys to death, but you know, you, you can't necessarily trust everybody. Right. So if, if we're, if we're talking to a technology vendor and they're saying, oh man, we are the greatest thing in the world. We kill it with everybody else. Make them prove it, make them prove it. Um, because from, from an investment standpoint, you know, you, you'd hate to be the one holding the bag and not having done your homework. Um, you know, and that's where, um, that's, that's really kind of, that's really been the, the biggest thing for us. And I know for me, um, I'm not a tech guy. Like I was running branches before, before doing this. So, you know, learning about, you know, EDI file this and, you know, FTP that's and all this other stuff. A lot of that was new to me. Um, but it's, so it's been, I've, I needed somebody who was easy to deal with. Like that was, that was paramount for me being easy to deal with and kind of helping me through the process. Um, and, you know, but ultimately, you know, you, you guys are going to know your business. You know, we're talking to people in the manufacturing space here now to kind of a completely different set of needs and like what I needed in wholesale distribution, but some of these things are still the same. Um, you know, and I think ease of ease of use, ease of onboarding, you know, the, the, how quickly the solution can get delivered was also very important for us too. Um, and because I think in, in the technology space, one of the things that lacks is kind of how long the solutions actually take to be delivered. You know, they'll say, oh, okay, yeah, sure. It'll take nine months to get this up and running for you or six months to get this up and running for you. And then fast forward, you're a year down the road and it hasn't happened. Um, so that was, that was very, very important. That was very important for us. Very important for me because I was, you know, again, small team. I was the guy really being the big hammer, hitting the nail, trying to drive this thing home. And it had to be easy for me. Yeah, you, you're, you're, you're next on the line. You know, it's our job to make sure it <laughs> doesn't get broken, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Nick, thank you. Thank you so much. Again, really appreciate your time, Nick. Um, and uh, Absolutely. 